largest, most significant challenge of our generation, of many generations, the most significant challenge of our lifetime. Knowing that the traditional knowledge that's within our lands and territories are key to solving this global crisis. Knowing that not only do we have proven strategies for how we inter interrelate with the land and the animals and the plants, but those are proven from the beginning of time, generation after generation after generation. The first stewards of the planet, the first stewards who recognize limitations of human capacity and the importance of having a very valuable relationship with our natural world and natural environment. That was key, that was critical. So after meeting, after meeting, and not being able to have that conversation as a centerpiece, but always an afterthought, and always an issue we'll take up at another time. It's, it's an honor and a privilege to stand here today before so many people to have this the topic. This the place where we can come together with such a diversity, but yet so much as a common denominator. That thing that, that joins us all. I'd like to talk a little bit about the challenges that we face, what we, what we can do, and then I also want to talk just briefly about our experience at Quinault and how we address our climate change. We know as Native people that we do have that special connection with the, the natural world. In the Pacific Northwest, we have prized salmon, we have beautiful shores, coastlines, we have large old growth timber, and we have plants that we use for medicines, for food, and for ceremonies, for art, for basketry. And we know that not only do we have that special connection with our land and the animals and the natural world, but so too do our brothers and sisters, our other indigenous peoples throughout the world. Early in my career as an elected official and the latter part of my career as an attorney for the Coral Nation, I realized there are not only indigenous people within the United States, who have these value systems. But there are hundreds of millions of people throughout the world, indigenous peoples, who actively practice traditions, who actively utilize the lands, respect the lands, are good stewards of the lands, and have that spiritual connection that all things are connected and what we do to the earth, what we do to the natural world, we do to ourselves, as in the words of Chief Seattle. So we know that we are the front line of this natural environment. We are front line witnesses to the decline and the decimation. We see everyday neighbors outside of our communities who have an absolute opposite view and value system, who have no problem in decimating the natural world for individual gain, for corporate gain, for short-term gain, without regard to how those decisions those actions will impact future generations, not only our generation, but future generations. And we've been witness to see animals drive to the north. We've been witness to seeing the erosion of our coastline, the melting of the permafrost. Some villages, entire villages, are having to move out and move away. We've also seen plants and the changing some plants are blooming at times they should be blooming. Some plants are moving higher up into the mountains. Some plants are moving to the north. We also have recognized on the Pacific Ocean and the coast, dead zones, the ocean without oxygen, miles and miles of beach strewn with dead fish because the ocean lacks the necessary oxygen. We also see glaciers. I took an airplane, excuse me, a helicopter trip into the Olympic Mountains. The Quinault Nation had been working on a blueback restoration initiative, and we knew that the glacier was a critical part of a uh, study how we're going to really restore and provide a healthy ecosystem in the upper Quinault. Our photographer had asked me, Bonnie, would you take a trip with us to go see the glacier? I said, absolutely, I want to see this firsthand. As we came over the ridge and looked at the Anderson Glacier, it was gone. 
The entire glacier disappeared. We were there to take pictures to see how far back it had receded. It was gone. My heart sank, and I thought, I can't imagine another generation of Quinaults trying to explain to them how our rich blueback salmon tasted. The only salmon in the world that has that connection to the Quinault people, the only salmon in the world that has that taste, that texture, the only salmon in the world that has been a prized symbolic uh, symbol of our culture at Quinault. You can go to Quinault Nation and ask anyone about blueback. You'll see it, eyes light up and a, a very positive reaction. That's a central part of who we are. And that glacier keeps the, the waters cool, keeps the water level to the appropriate place. Now it's gone. No more glaciers. And we know that that's happening all over the world. We also know that the ocean is becoming more acidic. And what can we do to, to combat those challenges? Well, as I look around and as I travel around, I've seen that Indian people, indigenous people, tribal governments, tribal nations, are coming up with innovative ways of combating climate change. Because those innovative ways are deeply rooted in that foundation of traditional knowledge. That knowledge that has proven through the centuries to be the best practice. And scientists more and more are discovering what native people are doing and indigenous people around the world, those are the best practices. And they're starting to look to our communities. How can we utilize that knowledge? And it's important to note that to solve this crisis, it depends on science, it depends on good policies, it depends on economics, but it also depends on that cultural and historic piece. And only we can bring that to the table. Only we can bring that to be part of the conversation. And it's important that those of you in this room are examples of the type of leadership that's necessary to go back home, to embrace your culture, embrace your traditions, embrace that knowledge, develop it, teach your young people, preserve it, and set a course where future generations will not only know that knowledge, but will become part of their daily practice. That's how we're going to survive in our communities. And we need to develop that to bring to the, the table, to these conversations. Because they're not only going to happen here, but around the world. I read an article just this last week that in the United States, a thousand counties declared a natural disaster. 26 states due to this heat wave. We're going to see more and more as time goes on, the sense of urgency. And people are going to become desperate in that same article, they talked about uh, helium uh, shooting up ar arson arsenal into the, the atmosphere to try to create some sort of solar effect. And these scientists were talking about these out-of-the-world, literally out-of-the-world strategies to try to protect the, the Earth from these impacts that are likely going to happen in the next decade, two decades, and it's going to become seemingly impossible and people will be desperate. So it's very important that we take the time as indigenous peoples to, to hear these panels, to look at the strategies, to come together, because when that time comes, when the world will finally pay attention to this critical issue, we will be well poised to provide not only real answers, but meaningful answers that are deeply rooted in our societies and our cultures and traditions. We need to do that. We also need to recognize, outside of our communities, we need to align with state federal policymakers, with other policymakers, because no one in society will have the ability to, to solve this global crisis. It will require partnerships. It will require those friendships. It will require that relationship where we can come together to develop strategies that are sustainable, that are comprehensive, and that will be able to provide solutions to each of these challenges. We need to reach out to the private sector. With uh, renewable energies, opportunities we have, they too are looking, how can we assist humanity? How can we assist society in developing strategies to address this, this critical issue? We also need to look at 
scientists and academics to be able to research, to measure the success. At a gut level, at an instinctual level, we know what we do at home is good for the, the earth. We know the practices, the respect that we have for the plants, for our lands, for the animals, that respect that is timeless. We know at a gut level that those are good practices. We seek the Creator's wisdom in everything that we do through ceremonies, through gatherings, through salmon ceremonies, those sort of things. We bring that knowledge into our communities that is beyond us as human beings, knowing that our limitations, our limited minds, as a present day society, we need to stand on the shoulders of our ancestors, those who come before us who dedicated their lives to improve our natural world, who embrace those cultures. We need to stand on their shoulders and be prepared to offer to the generation that follows us a good, solid, decent, meaningful plan. Educate our young people, bring them along. And I'm so happy to hear that we have young people in the room who are part of this this conversation that we're going to have over the next few days. That's important. That's very, very important to reach out to that next generation to bring them along. Now, I want to turn just, just very briefly, because I know the senator is on her way, and I'm told I, I have to fill in some time here. <laughs> so, <laughs> I have my five to ten minute uh, presentation and introduction is... There you go. Uh, but I will go off script as well uh, and talk a little bit about what we've done at Quinault. And I do appreciate uh, having this opportunity to share with everyone in the room uh, what we've done. When I first got into office, as I mentioned, my first year, a tribal elder talked to me about climate change. I had no idea at the time what climate change really was. And that same elder talked to my 8th grade class when I was just a youngster and told our class, someday water is going to be more valuable than oil. And I remember thinking at the time, that's impossible. How could water be more valuable than oil? But that elder knew at some point, laws of supply and demand, good, clean water was going to be a scarce resource. And as a scarce resource, the value of that clean water was going to be more and more expensive than even oil. And he was right. Today, when you look at the cost of a bottle of water, and you look at the cost of a barrel of oil, water is more valuable than oil. And it's because it's a scarce resource. That same elder in my first year in office talked to me about this thing of clean air and how clean air is going to become a scarce resource. And as a scarce resource, the value of that commodity is going to be in high demand. That there are going to be industries popping up. We are a timber tribe. There are going to be industries popping up that are looking at this thing called carbon sequestration. And that there is an economy that is being built around this. People are already trying to figure out how can we exploit this opportunity for capital gain. But we need to be prepared. We need to look at how we plant trees. We have an industrial based model. We plant, we wait 30 years, we harvest the timber, we plant, we thin, we harvest. But by sealing out the rotation cycle, we're allowing those trees to continue to bring about good, clean air. So, he told me, you need to go figure this out. <laughs> I said, okay, we will figure this out. We will figure out how we can start to address this issue here at home. It started with looking at restoring the upper quinault. And he pulled together some of our scientists. We had a lot of data and statistics. And he knew back then even before that October afternoon when I climbed in a helicopter to go look at that glacier to see that it was melted, he knew then that that was imminent and that that was likely going to happen. And so as we set out, we thought this is not only a scientific issue, 
This is clearly a sovereignty issue, and it's clearly a political issue. If we have a valuable resource, you can look to the Black Hills in South Dakota to see when the non-Indian community discovered a valuable resource in those Black Hills, gold, the land grabs, and the opportunities others took to try to exploit resources for their own benefit at the expense of tribal communities. That clean air that we have, all those hundreds and hundreds of thousands of acres of old growth timber or trees, what about the policies that are being developed that's going to capture that? If you look at a map of the United States, all the green areas are on tribal lands. Places like Quinault, in Minnesota, the Everglades, all the places where you don't see brown areas where the lands have been exploited for commercial gain, for private gain, those sacred lands, the first stewards of this nation are those in our lands and territories. I saw another map that showed if you take all of the Indian lands in the United States, <coughs> capitalize it, solar, wind, we could power the United States three times over. Those are other people looking at our resources. How can our resources benefit the rest of the world? Do we have a say as Indian people about our lands, about our territories? Do we have a say in the policies? When you look at the climate action plans, you see states including the entire footprint of the state, including our tribal lands that are reserved by treaty. So how are they calculating those into their action plans? Are we at the table as, as they develop those climate action plan strategies? We try to get to the table time and time again, and we keep getting rejected. So we need to, as Indian people, look at our strategies. We need to look at the science, the culture, and the political implications, as well as the economic value. We then, after we assess our potential, we adopted a set of comprehensive climate change policies in April of 2008. We then went out internationally, and we started to talk to countries outside of the United States. We attended COP14, the Conference of Parties, in Poznan, on Poland. It was our goal there to reach out, to create a contact group, a five-state, five-nation contact group. We figured if we could just get 10 groups together to start, uh, we might be able to get some headway here. So we talked to the governments of Germany, we talked to the governments of uh, Panama, of Bolivia, uh, we talked to um, uh, what was the other three? There were three uh, countries in uh, Denmark. Denmark has a foreign policy uh, respecting indigenous peoples. And the other country, the obvious country, was the United States. So when we arrived to the United States door, we knocked and we got the six inch treatment. The door opened six inches and we asked, What do you want? <laughs> Whereas when we went to Denmark and we went to Germany, the door was open, they offered us cookies, and they wanted to have a nice conversation with us about climate change. We got to the United States door, and we weren't even allowed into the room. There was an NGO official, native, great, tall, dark, approached before we knocked on the door and said, the Pono Nation has political leadership here, and they will be coming to talk to you. When we knocked on the door and I introduced myself, the reaction I had was, there was another Indian here about an hour ago. Can't all of you Indians get together and just send one person? <laughs> that was the reaction. <laughs> uh, so we set out to develop these relationships with countries outside of the United States because we know that those other countries have looked at carbon sequestration. They have looked at all these things that have been proven to be effective and those that have proven to not be effective. And there's a scientific community. We had a conversation with Dow Industries of Europe about R&D. And we said, if you want to see a balanced ecosystem, you don't have to look into a laboratory to figure out, come out to, come out to Quinault. You can see a river system from glacier to ocean with absolutely no development. So those opportunities are there for us. If we can step out in our own communities to embrace our 
rich, very rich, very vibrant, very alive cultures and history that our ancestors gifted us. They paid the price. They instilled the wisdom in us. And it's up to us to embrace that, to build a course for future generations. We have a responsibility here today, other conversations to come together, to share that rich knowledge and tradition. We have a responsibility to utilize that knowledge and tradition in ways that only we can do. And we have a responsibility to reach out to our partners, our policy partners, our partners in universities and academics, scientists, our partners in the private sector, bring along our youth, and set a good, solid course for future generations. It's there, the greatest challenge of our generation, the greatest challenge facing the world, is only gonna get worse, and we need to rise to the occasion, we need to be the first stewards and be the leaders throughout the world to bring that knowledge together, because our value system is a sacred system. It's a sacred system that we have brought together, and it has been proven throughout the beginning of time. It's a timeless, rich tradition. And we are very blessed and honored to be here today. I'm very honored to address you, and I thank each of you. And if the senator is here, she's not here. <laughs>